see you all here tonight. I'm just going to give a quick reminder if you have a cell phone, if you wouldn't mind to silence it. Thank you very much. This is the fifth of six lectures for the year, and I hope you will join us next month on May 15th. We will have a panel lecture in May, and it will be an update on projects that are helping to uh, discover the legacy of slavery and enslavement in Lynchburg. So it will be Ted Delaney, Noel Beverly, both from the Lynchburg City Museum, and myself from Jones talking about projects that we're doing to um, name people who were enslaved in Lynchburg. So I think it'll be an exciting evening. I hope you can come. Um, just a reminder that we do post our lectures on YouTube. Um, so take a look at our website and you can follow to the link for YouTube. So this lecture will be online. Probably look for it in another six weeks or so. Um, we are nearing the end of our fiscal year, so this is just a quick uh, plea here for the fact that Jones Memorial Library uh, re does not receive any city funding, any government funding. So we are entirely privately funded, and we do do an annual appeal every year, and we welcome donations. We also welcome donations of materials. So if you have things in your attic, or your basement, hopefully not basement, um, or uh, you know, photos, things from previous generations that you have that you're not sure where they should live on for future generations. We are a wonderful repository for Lynchburg's history. And basically we have a broad collection mandate. It's pretty much anyone who lived in Lynchburg, maybe they moved out, maybe they moved in, or places in Lynchburg. So it's all about the story of Lynchburg and the surrounding areas. So if you have anything and you thought, mm, I, know, I don't know if the next generation um, wants to care for that, we would love to have that privilege. So please think of us. Um, it is my privilege now to introduce our speaker tonight. John Cook received his BA and JD degrees from the University of Virginia. He was elected a circuit court judge for the 24th Judicial Circuit in 2008. He is also an adjunct faculty member at the University of Virginia Law School. Prior to 2008, he was a member of the law firm of Caskey and Frost for 25 years. As a lawyer, he served as a representative of the 24th Circuit on the State Bar Council. He also served on the State Bar Committee of Lawyer Discipline Sounds a little, uh... <laughs> um, he is a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and past chair of the Virginia chapter of the American Board of Trial Advocates. He currently serves on the committee for the preeminent national trial competition for law schools and judges at the finals in Texas. He is past president of the Lynchburg Morning Rotary Club and a Paul Harris Fellow. He has served on the boards of Kids Haven, Lynchburg Symphony Orchestra, Lynchburg Historical Society, Lynchburg Youth Services, Boonesboro Country Club, and James River Day School. He is a member of Peakland Baptist Church and has served as moderator and chairman of the Congregational Council. Without further ado, please welcome John Cook. Thank you, Deb. Um, I, w I listened to a Billy Hansen podcast with you, Deb, and I appreciate, uh, learned a lot about from that, about Jones Memorial Library in that uh, interview with you, and I appreciate all you do, and this is a fantastic place. And I've been able to attend two of the lectures this year, and I thank you for putting on these lectures. So thank you, and thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Right, so we're going to talk about the Virginia Constitution, and I'm, I like talking about the Virginia Constitution, all right? So I enjoy it. So uh, this all started in 2022. Um, Kim Payne did a specs paper, and he talked about city government, and he talked about different constitutions, and I realized I didn't know a lot about the history of Virginia Constitution. I'm a double who, you know, so that was in the resume. 
So that, Mr. Strohsmeiner, he's my hokey buddy, that means you went to UVA, you got two degrees, okay? <laughs> so I don't remember ever studying about the Virginia Constitution, which is amazing to me, and I'm not sure now people study about it. I don't know. I don't know. But I, went, I started reading everything I knew about, uh, could about it, and I delivered a specs paper on it in, in October of 22, and I've given this talk to very, various groups you know, since then, and of course I was asked to give this lecture. One question I had in one of the talks is, you know, why do we care about the Virginia Constitution? Isn't it the U.S. Constitution that matters? You know, it is the supreme law of the land, but I say to you, my answer to that was, if you live in Virginia, the Virginia Constitution affects you a lot more on a daily basis than the U.S. Constitution. Uh, our city government, our county governments are defined, uh, our constitutional officers, my Valerie Younger, Campbell County Circuit Court clerk I work with every day is here. She's a constitutional officer, the Commonwealth Attorney, the Sheriff, the General Assembly, the Governor, the Public Education, the uh, State Corporation Commission. All those things are defined and of course the judiciary. And I say to you that you're much more likely to end up in state court than you are in federal court. <laughs> That's the way it works. You're much more likely. So it, it's very important, uh, the Virginia Constitution. And uh, here is uh, a quote that's very good about the Virginia Constitution. It's from Professor A. E. Dick Howard, and we'll talk more about him at the University of Virginia Law School. And I'm going to read this because it's a great quote. No document of American constitutionalism, save the federal constitution itself, draws so deeply on the great themes of American constitutional legal developments as does the Virginia Constitution. Its origins were contemporaneous with the events leading to the independence. Some of the greatest minds of the founders' generations made contributions to it and its development over the ensuing two centuries have been shaped by the conflicts and movements central to the history of the American nation. I had another quote that, that uh, I read a book about state constitutions, and there was a foreword to that book by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she quoted this quote from uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, the Frenchman who traveled and knew, who was the expert on democracy, and his quote, the grace, greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than other nations, but in her ability to repair her faults. And so that's the title of the paper. And, and part of the history of the Virginia Constitution is about Virginia repairing her faults. Um, and so first I want to start off with how many Virginia Constitutions have there been? Six. Six. Yes. <laughs> you know, there is some debate about that. So, who, do, who, who said six? Who got six? Your hokey friend. Oh, okay. You knew it. Okay, good deal. Good deal. I'm surprised because I, I talked to the lawyers and they didn't know. You know so, so, I'm going to say 1776, 1830, 1851, 1869, 1902, 1971. You know, there have been amendments along the way. But those are the constitutions. Now, Thomas Jefferson had frequently said that a constitution should be revised at regular intervals uh, so that it may be held on with periodic repairs from generation to generation. He actually studied European mortality tables and determined that 50% of the population changed every 19 to 20 years. Uh, and he felt that the uh, Constitution should be revised every, during that period of 19 to 20 years. He proclaimed that the earth belonged to the living. Uh, you know, we have not revised our Constitution as often as Thomas Jefferson would have liked. You know, for this, con for this, the journey that I went on studying about the Virginia Constitution, I studied all the Constitutions. I read them all. Yeah, I don't recommend you do that. <laughs> but you know, the early changes had a lot to do with, with Virginia moving to the West. A lot of issues with Virginia moving to the West. How were we handling that? How were we going to fund things? How was representation going to go? Uh, and the, but each one of these constitutions had positive parts to it. 1851 is the first constitution that said the governor was directly elected by the people. Before that, the General Assembly picked the, the governor. Uh, and the 1869 Constitution is the first one that had provisions for public education. 
The 1902 Constitution is the first one that had a state corporation commission. I visited, you know, the state capitol as part of doing this paper, the Virginia State Capitol. At the capitol, there are pictures of the delegates at the different conventions. Here is a picture of the 1830 convention. Here we go. Um, it was by a famous author, artist at the time, George Catlin was his name. He actually did watercolor pictures of every delegate at the convention. Um, and then he did an oil painting based on those watercolor pictures. Uh, this convention in 1830 was a gathering of giants. James Monroe was the chairman or president of the convention. James Monroe was right here in the Senate, right here. And then this right here is Chief Justice John Marshall is right here. He was a member of the convention. But also James Madison was there. He was the only one that was actually there in 1776 as well. John Tyler was there, seven U.S., who was a future president, seven senators, 15 representatives, and four governors were present. Uh, so it was a, a gathering of a, a, a lot of great people at the time uh, to do that. That's how much they honored the Virginia Constitution. Here's a picture of the convention in 1869. Uh, the Congress required southern states that succeeded to adopt a new constitution to regain statehood. Twenty-four of the elected delegates were African Americans. The constitution was ratified by popular vote in 1869, and Ulysses Grant restored Virginia's rights to representation in Congress, and the military occupation of Virginia ended in 1870. Here is an actual display that's at our Lynchburg Museum. Uh, about Samuel Kelso, a black educator from Campbell County uh, at the convention who presented the resolution provided for the first statewide system of public education uh, in Virginia. At the time, 44% of all Virginians older than 10 could not read. And so he was from Campbell County. And here's the, on Court Street in Lynchburg, uh, here's, that's uh, Crystal Evans, Jane White, uh, there's the uh, historical mar marker between, right there at the school administration building on, on Court Street of Samuel Kelso, who made that resolution in 1869. My talk today is primarily going to be about two other constitutions, though, 1776 and 1971. 1776, the story starts, uh, the battles of Lexington and Concord had occurred the year before, uh, fighting had started in Virginia. The Navy, the British Navy, had destroyed Norfolk. The Norfolk courthouse was in flames. The royal governor had fled Williamsburg and dissolved the House of Burgesses, and he was on a ship, British ship, in the Chesapeake Bay. The Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia and passed a resolution asking each colony to form a new government. A reluctant 50-year-old man traveled to Williamsburg to serve as a delegate. When he had previously been asked to go to Philadelphia to the Continental Convention, he gave a passionate reply, declining due to his poor health and his brood of motherless children. His, mo his wife had died uh, in 73, giving birth to twins, their ninth and tenth children. But they got him to go to Williamsburg. He arrived in Williamsburg two weeks late because of gout, a lifelong condition he had. <clears throat> the delegates at the, in Williamsburg passed a resolution to draft a Declaration of Independence and a Declaration of Rights before forming a new government. The late arriver was assigned to that committee to draft these declarations. He quickly became frustrated with the 30-member committee lamenting that the committee was overcharged with useless members and would likely be plagued with a thousand ridiculous and impractical proposals. Have you ever been on a committee like that? <laughs> so what do you do? So you know what he did? He spent nine days in Raleigh Tavern and he drafted in Raleigh Tavern, and he's considered the principal architect of the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Virginia Constitution. The biography I read about the reluctant participant is entitled The Forgotten Founder. Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence later that year, had the Declaration of Rights by his side when he drafted it. Benjamin Franklin used it in Pennsylvania driving 
in drafting the Pennsylvania Constitution, and John Adams used it in Massachusetts. The exact language has been copied in several state constitutions and the French Bill of Rights. James Madison used it to draft the United States Bill of Rights 15 years later. Who is this man? No. no. The lawyers didn't know it either. <laughs> Who said? George Mason. George Mason. There you go. David Abrams got it. Oh. All right, so here's his bust. At the, and that's just the Virginia Museum of History. Now, the, his picture there. Yes. And here's his bust at the state capitol. Last summer, well, the summer before I did this paper, I a visit his home in Gunston Hall. It's seven miles down the Potomac River from Mount Vernon. Uh, here it is right here. Gunston Hall, George Mason's home. Here's a quote from a letter from Thomas Jefferson about George Mason. The fact is unquestionable that the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of Virginia were drawn originally by George Mason, one of our really great men and of the first order of greatness. His biographer, Jeff, Broadwater called it a constant sense of wonder how this man with little formal education and no legal training was able to draft the Declaration. He notes that Mason had access to one of the largest libraries in Virginia owned by his uncle, John Mercer, a lawyer. There were many writings of the time concerning the rights of men. George Mason was able to bring these together and these ideas into a new consensus. When I went to... Um, Gunson Hall, I also went to George Mason University. Here's the statute at Wilkins Plaza at George Mason University of George Mason. In his left hand, he offers out the Declaration of Rights. Uh, in his uh, symbol, in, in, in his, and he holds in his right hand three books, Rousseau, Locke, and Hume. Those are some of the books he relied on to, to draft the Declaration of Rights. In front of him is a quote from Rousseau's social contract at, uh, and the tra tra translation is, all men are born equal and everywhere he's in chains. So what is in the Declaration of Rights? Now I'm going to give you, for you, a copy of the Declaration of Rights. So, uh, let's see if you can, how about you pass some of these down. Uh, Deb, would you help you pass some of these down? I'm going to give you... So you got a copy of the Declaration of Rights now. You come to Campbell County Circuit Court and you have these Declaration of Rights with you, I can tell you I'll be on that bench and I'll be very impressed, okay? But I'll tell you right now, I can't promise your sentence will be any less, okay? All right? So what's in there? Um, uh, many of the rights were derived from the Magna Carta and the English be Benefit be Bill of Rights. Let's look at a few of them. Article 12, that the freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained by despotic governments. Article 8 has the right to trial by jury, and in a criminal case it has to be with unanimous consent uh, with an impartial jury of his business or his peers, and the, in the Article 12 says the ancient trial by jury is preferable to any other and is ought to be held sacred. And I read that to jurors when I'm talking to jurors uh, and, uh, when they're serving on the jury in the term in Campbell County about the sacred right to trial by jury. The right to be confronted by your witnesses in Article 8. The right against unreasonable search and seizures, Article 10. Article 16 has... For the first time in Northern America, the legal principle of full religious freedom was affirmed without jeopardizing the status of the established church in Virginia. Jefferson's later 1786 act for establishing religious freedom would separate church and state. But what was not in the Magna Carta, or not in the English Bill of Rights? Uh, that all men are equally free and independent. 
that all power is vested and cons consequently derived from the people. The government ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection and security of the people, nation, or community. And then th this Article 16 was added by Patrick Henry, who would be the first governor of Virginia. That no free government or the blessings of liberty can be served, served to any people but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. You know, I regularly swear in public servants. I don't think I ever swore in Randy Nelson. I'm sure I didn't. <laughs> no. He's, he's been in my court, though. Been in Campbell, well, my court, Campbell County court. But I, I, you know how it goes. I swear or affirm that I'll support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia. You repeated those words, Randy. And sometimes I want to say, did you read this part? <laughs> the government is for the common benefit and the, the fundamental principles. It's not about me. It's not about my power. It's not about my ego. It's for the public, the common benefit. So these words are important. The word community appears six times in the Declaration of Rights. A continual issue in the history of Virginia is who is a member of that community. Article 1 provides that men had inherent rights. Added to that was the phrase, when they enter a state of society. That's Article 1. That was to exclude enslaved men from having rights. Also, in Article 6, only those who had a permanent common interest in the community could vote. This meant owning land, and it wasn't until 1850, 1850 that you didn't have to have an interest in land to be able to vote. Today, Virginia is the only state where those convicted of felonies must apply individually to the governor for their voting rights to be restored. Most states allow those restoration of rights when the felon either serves his time or completes his probation. There was an article in the Lynchburg newspaper about this that was authored by Professor Howard, who I quoted earl earlier. Women did not vote in Virginia until Congress and 36 states ratified the 19th Amendment in 1920. Uh, the Virginia General Assembly overwhelmingly voted against it at the time <laughs> and did not ratify it until 1952. I don't know what the purpose was, but they ratified it in 1952. Here is a wonderful painting entitled Adoption of the Declaration of Rights. This is right out outside the Senate building and Patrick Henry is standing and he's got his glasses up and his, apparently he argued a lot and had his glasses up in his hair. George Mason is, is next, Mr. Edmund Pendleton is in the chair, the long chair, he's the, was the chairman uh, or the speaker and then George Mason is to his right. But that's right outside the Senate uh, building at the state capitol. Uh, it's by uh, John Clifton is that painting. What is the legacy of George Mason? Here's a quote from Harry Truman, who says it very well. Too few Americans realize the vast debt we owe George Mason. His immortal Declaration of Rights in 1776 was one of the finest and loftiest creations ever struck from the mind of man. George Mason it was who first gave concrete expression to those inalienable human rights that belong to every American citizen that are today the bedrock of our democracy. That is why I say that George Mason will ever hold a special place in our hearts. I frequently see references, newspaper, other places, and to at schools a student's bill of rights, hospitals a patient bill of rights. And shouldn't we be proud in Virginia that the first bill of rights in this country was in the, the Commonwealth of Virginia? And that's the, that's the story of the 76 Constitution. So now I'm going to move to the other one, the 1971. But first, it sort of starts in 1968, but i got to go back to 1898. In that year, the U.S. Supreme Court decided in the case of Williams versus Mississippi, it was a 9-0 decision, that Mississippi's Constitution included the poll tax, the literacy test, and the grandfather clause did not violate the 14th Amendment. 
The court found that the requirements did not discriminate against towards African Americans and there was no judicial remedy. Sometimes the Supreme Court gets it wrong. <laughs> in 1902, delegates from Virginia gathered to rewrite the Virginia Constitution. Central Virginia was prominent at the convention. The president of the convention was John Goode from Bedford County, Carter Glass from Lynchburg, and then John Roy Daniel, born at Point of Honor, was also there from, uh, I think he was registered as from Campbell County. The pronounced goal was to eliminate every Negro vote we can get rid of. We do not come here prompted by an impartial purpose in reference to Negro suffrage. We come here to sweep the field of expedience for the purpose of finding some constitutional method of ridding ourselves of it forever and we have approval of the Supreme Court of the United States in making this effort. And that was a delegate from Norfolk, his quote. They were successful. In the 1904 presidential election, there were slightly more than half of the votes cast in 1900. Although there were 147,000 African Americans in Virginia in 1902 convention, only 21,000 remained on the voter list. By October in Richmond, Richmond went from 6,427 African-American voters to 760. Small, count, small towns had the same experience. In Culpeper, it went from 1,075 African-American regiments to 153. In 1912, Virginia allowed parties to hold primary elections limited to white voters. The Democratic Party quickly excluded African-Americans. This allowed the Byrd organization to dominate Virginia politics. Harry Byrd, Sr., was governor of Virginia from 1926 to 1930 and senator from 1933 to 1965. The Byrd organization controlled Virginia politics from the statewide office to the constitutional offices in each locality, the sheriff, the commonwealth attorney, the clerk, and the judge. The organization was extremely successful in building its power on highly restricted franchise. Indeed, in the 1940s, in the height of Byrd's power, fewer than 12% of adults participated in election. elections. A large part of this was from the poll tax, the literacy tests, and the grandfather clauses of the 1902 Constitution. They also gerrymandered districts with uneven populations to cement their power. The Byrd organization was known for fiscally conservative policy. One historian bluntly said they didn't steal money, but they stole democracy. Political science VOK equipped that by contrast, Mississippi is a hotbed of democracy. Indeed, a smaller portion of adult Virginians voted during the first half of the 20th century than any other state in the country or any other country in the world that had or pretended to have a representative democracy. This is a history that Virginians cannot be proud of. Now we turn to 1968, it was the year of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. The country was in turmoil with Vietnam. There were riots and protests. 41 people died in a riot in Richmond. There were protests at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Virginia had been a leader in the 60s in mass resistance against the integration of schools. There have been times, believe it or not, that we were more divided than we appear to today. Governor Mills Godwin, who had been part of the Byrd organization, called for a commission on constitutional revision. It did not seem like a good time to revise the Constitution. Maryland, the year before, had failed in its efforts to adopt a new Constitution. The people of Maryland had voted by 60 to 40 percent margin to reject a Constitution approved at a convention. New York, New Mexico, Oregon, Arkansas, and Idaho had recently failed to make changes to their constitution. The 1902 constitution no longer met federal law. In 1964, the Supreme Court required a uh, reapportionment decision, required one person, one vote. No longer could you have significant variation in pop population for voting purposes. The court struck down the Virginia's poll tax. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act applied to Virginia and restricted the use of literary tests. 
The Byrd organization's policy of pay as you go, the fiscal policy, did not meet the goals of Virginia. Virginia was com becoming much more urban and less rural, and there were needs for roads, schools, highways, and the pay as you go uh, did not no longer fit Virginia, and Virginia had a very limited ability to borrow money through bonds. Here's a headline from Richmond paper in 1968. Governor Godwin appointed to the commission composed of Im impartial and eminently qualified citizens whose stature is commensurate with the task to be performed and whose recommendations would command the respect and thoughtful consideration of the General Assembly and the people of Virginia. When I look at that, I'm going, all men? <laughs> they were all men. <laughs> but it's an impressive group of men. Lewis Powell, former president of the American Bar Association and, and future U.S. Supreme Court Justice. Hardy Dillard, the dean of University of Virginia Law School and eventually member of the World Court at The Hague. Oliver Hill, preeminent civil rights lawyer who argued board, Brown versus Board of Education with Thurgood Marshall. Colgate Darden, former governor of Virginia and third president of the University of Virginia. David Pascal, former superintendent of public institutions, president of William and Mary. Albertus Harrison, former governor of Virginia and Virginia Supreme Court Justice. Ted Dalton, two-time Republican candidate for governor and a federal judge. George Cochran, former Virginia Senator and Virginia Supreme Court Justice. Alexander Harmon from Pulaski, a circuit court judge. Jay Sloan Kukendall, a Winchester attorney and former president of the Virginia State Bar. And Albert Bryan, judge of the Alexander Circuit Court and would be a future federal judge. The chairman of the commission, uh, Albert Harrison appointed a 35-year-old law professor, A. E. Dick Howard, executive director. That's what they appointed him. Howard, A. E. Dick Howard was appointed. Professor Howard was first in his class at the University of Richmond and first in his class at the University of Virginia Law School. He spent two years as a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford. He served as clerk for Justice Hugo Black on the U.S. Supreme Court. He assisted Justice Black in the writing of the court's decision in Gideon versus Wainwright. When I was in high school, I read a book called Gideon's Trumpet. And it's about Gideon who's in a Florida prison, I believe, and he writes his handwritten petition to the Supreme Court because he was in jail and he didn't have counsel and he was indigent. And that case held based on the handwritten petition he uh, sent to the Supreme Court uh, set the standard that every state has to provide counsel if, in any case when someone can be incarcerated if they're indigent. And he helped write, he assisted Justice Black in that opinion. The commission had a tall task. Although it was called a revision commission, it was really rewriting the Constitution. To revise the Constitution, what you had to do, you had to have two straight general assemblies vote in favor of it. So you, 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 you had to vote, then you had an election, then you had another vote, and then you had a referendum to the people. It's called a procedure of amendment in the form of a substitute. The commission worked with thorough and deliberate means and after five public hearings submitted a 542-page report to the General Assembly in January of 1969, about nine months after it had been commissioned. Pre Professor Howard was named he had been executive director of the commission to write the report. Then he was named counsel for the General Assembly. He met with various committees on the Senate and the House, and the General Assembly passed it in April of 1969 and then in the regular session in 1970. In 19, November of 1970, the vote went to the people. Now, Linwood Holton was now the governor of Virginia, the first Republican governor of the century. Uh, he asked Howard to chair the campaign committee for the new Constitution. So, and then with a budget of $100,000 for private contributions, the, the committee was called Virginians for the New Constitution. Professor, I, re, I reviewed his files at the University of Virginia Law School. He spoke about everywhere you could speak. He spoke all over Virginia to local committees about the new, new Constitution. He conducted an enormous educational campaign. He noted that Maryland was confident in the passage of the new Constitution and had a poor educational campaign and lost. He sought resolutions from organizations across Virginia, communicated with editors of the newspapers. He sought the endorsements of leaders across the state. The campaign was called Bringing Government Closer to the People. Now here's a cartoon from the opposition. They were panning these out. So 
Don't let it happen. Um, it is entitled Concerned Citizens, Don't Let It Happen, Stop, Look, Go, Vote, No November. It has a mouse trap with a voter depicted as a mouse who says, Just for me. He stands next to the mouse trap with a bait of a revised charter. Lost local control, regional government, and unbridled spending are listed as results of the new charter. And it has a picture of Professor A. E. Dick Howard, and it says, Wonder if he will take the bait this time. And a quote from former Governor Garner, some of the proposals are so complex that people must accept them on faith. They, these were passed out as handbills, and according to Professor Harrow, they're conspiracy theorists, they had those back then too, who said that surely Virginians would not have written this Constitution. It must have been written somewhere else. Maybe it was written in Moscow or Beijing. Or worse yet, maybe it was written in New York or Chicago. It's a foreign project. Other opponents argued that they were going to use this Constitution to raise our taxes. And Barry Wall, the farmer, Farmville newspaper editor, proposed the Constitution because he argued it would consolidate school districts and enforce school busing. There was a provision in the Constitution that empowered the General Assembly and Board of Education to take small districts and combine them. So the opponents of the Constitution argued, ha, there's the camel's noose. They're going to use it to bus our children. So it was a hot issue. So what do you think the vote was when it went to the people? So here we go. What was the vote? November 3rd, 1970. 71.8%. In his files, I was able to see what Lynchburg did. But what did Lynchburg do? And you know what? I was, I was a math major, so you just got to rely on it. It's 71. It's what, about the same percentage in Lynchburg, 71%. A lot was accomplished in this Constitution. There's no way for me to go over everything, but here are some of the key accomplishments. Included in the Declaration of Rights was a free dis discrimination clause. This was a spe specific repudiation of the 1902 Constitution. In the Commission's draft, the word sex was not included in the anti-discrimination clause, and a delegate from Alexandria, Dorothy McMurray, requested that they added sex, and here she is. And they added it without controversy. Virginia had its own Equal Rights Amendment in this Constitution. The new Constitution also mandated that state and localities provide for public education. A locality, locality could no longer close its schools like Prince Edward County had done. Education was added to the Declaration of Rights. This addition to the Declaration of Rights about education was unsurpassed at a time in any state's constitution. The new constitution provided for revenue bonds and general obligation bonds that significantly increased Virginia's ability to meet its growing capital needs. The constitution also included a section on conservation. It shall, it, I'll let you look at it and read it. Uh, the, the Constitution was made more coherent with simple language and brevity of expression. Things that no longer applied were deleted from the Constitution. For instance, 1902 Constitution had a provision that you, if you were a person who fought in a duel or accepted a challenge to duel, that you could not vote. And I don't think they'd had anybody any while that had been dueling. There are a lot of clauses that did not belong in a constitution that they'd add over time and they were eliminated. The constitution went from over 30,000 words to 18,400 words. As I say, I've reviewed Professor Howard's files at the University of Virginia Law School. You know, he spent three years because first year he was the executive director of the commission. The next year he was counsel of the General Assembly and the next year he ran the campaign. So he campaigned. So he spent three years of his life working on this. He took nothing for granted and he left no stone unturned. His contributions were significant in the Constitution passing with 71.8% of the vote. Have you ever had anybody give you a book that's given you an impact in your life? Have you thought about that with your children, your grandchildren, and about the power of a book? Here's a book that was given to me when I was in my 20s by my grandmother. 
the book made a great impression on me. The Miracle in Philadelphia. And here's another from my grandmother. <laughs> Professor Howard is now 90 years old. And in May, he is retiring from the University of Virginia Law School. <laughs> He has assisted other countries in revising their constitutions, including Brazil, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland, Romania, and South America, South Africa. I mean. The Richmond Times Dispatch in the Library of Virginia include Professor Howard in their list of the greatest Virginians of the 20th century. In 2013, the University of Virginia recognized Professor Howard with his Thomas Jefferson Award the highest honor given to a faculty member at the University of Virginia. Dwayne Yancey, who's actually speaking to us tomorrow night at the Specs Club annual meeting tomorrow night, editor of Cardinal News, has written that talking to A. E. Dick Howard about the state constitution is akin to being able to talk to James Madison about the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> so I'm working on this paper. And I'm getting to the end of working on this paper and I teach at the University of Virginia, and I teach on Tuesday nights during COVID. And guess who's teaching at the next classroom from me is Professor A. D. Cowell. So I was able to talk to him a lot during that period of time. A few, uh, a few weeks, well, and you know, there's not many people there on Tuesday nights, so I was able to talk to him. <laughs> And one day, right before I finished my paper, I asked him, I said, Professor Howard, how did you get 71.8% of the people to vote for this? I said, was it like the miracle in Philadelphia? <laughs> he replied that he never expected that there would be a vote of 71.8%. And he wasn't going to call it a miracle. He lived it. But however, you know what he said to me? He said, John... There were more people that cared about the common benefit back then. You know, words directly from George Mason. It made me think of the importance of our leaders and our citizens to think about the common benefit and to return to the fundamental principles as stated in the Virginia Declaration of Rights. So Professor Howard, he was asking me about my paper and he said, John, would you send me your paper? And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm teaching at UVA Law School and I'm going to get a C. <laughs> so I sent it to him. He sent me a nice email saying it was an impressive comp accomplishment. He also sent me in the mail the two volume set, commentaries of the of the Virginia Constitution. And this is what he put in there. Here's Dick Howard. The appreciation for the passion you bring to our appreciation of constitutional democracy in Virginia. Professor A. Dick Howard, November 22. I'll cherish the books and thank you for coming for my paper. I think I was right on the time, by the way, Deb. <laughs> you gave me 45 minutes. You know, judges know about being brief. You know? Well, we were entranced. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. But feel free to um, just raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, you said that George Mason, the Declaration of Rights, was also used in Pennsylvania, yeah. Massachusetts, it's our, and Virginia. Is also a commonwealth. Is that a, a thread? Well, it's, uh, let's see, there are four states that are commonwealths. Right. Uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. Of course, Kentucky came out of Virginia. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, that, it's a, it's a, it, it means that the, the commonwealth, my understanding of that word, it, it's not like it has legal significance, but it means that it's a, it's, a, it's a government for the people. It's for the people of the good of the people, the common benefit. And so that, that term was adopted in its state. And I was in Texas for that competition last week, and I... You know, had, had he, I, can't, I can't help myself, but I always call it the Commonwealth. In every case I had, they're down in Texas. They don't know what that means down there. <laughs> anyway, but they, yeah, but that's, those are the four, 
four states that use that word. Well, but, yeah. it's, but it's symbolizing it's the government of the people. It's a but commonwealth, did yes. Did any other states use George Those, Mason's? Oh, I, yes, yes. But they didn't call themselves Constitution? No, no, no. But, 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 but I don't think commonwealth is actually in the Declaration of Rights anywhere. Okay. But the common benefit, of course, is in other states, too. Yeah. Yes, uh, Bert, yeah. Uh, why after the year 1968-69, I mean, Democrats control the General Assembly. Governors come and go. They're all yeah, Democrats, yeah. of course. So all, what? I mean, why, why did they pick that year rather than 63 or 64 or whatever? Well, I think it had a lot to do with what was going on in the whole 60s. But the thing is, you have to understand, Virginia was going through massive change. Mills Godwin, only governor... He was a Democratic part of the bird machine. After Linwood Holton, he ran as a Republican. The Democratic Party was split in half because the Democratic Party of Virginia had been this conservative party, mass resistance, and then Lyndon Johnson was the president, and they, were, they didn't like the national policies. Of, and so we really kind of had almost three parties. We had a split Democratic Party and a Republican Party that was finally uh, had their first governor in Linwood Holton in 1970. So a lot was going on. And those governors be better half. Okay. I, 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 yeah, I'm sure you're right about that. Yeah. So a lot of change was going on. Is there an interest in re-evaluating this Constitution uh, based on current situations? Well, you know, they have, a, you know, a lot of amendments have been tried. I mean, the, the thing about the felonies, that's been tried. It, it, it passed one General Assembly but didn't get through the next General Assembly to, to give felons their right to have a, a set rule on that. Virginia's the only state in the uh, country that the governor can't run two straight terms. You know, that's been thought about. Uh, there are other issues that have been thought about, but what's today? Can we get 51% of the people to read today is Wednesday? You know, can we? You know, I mean, I mean, I mean think about it. You know, how hard would it be now to get 71%, two General Assemblies and 71% of people to vote on something? Yes, Randy. Oh. By the way, what a great city council member. Yeah. 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 I appreciate your comments. You have said that you were a colleague a.e. Dick Howard. Well, I'm caught. Well, <laughs> if you talk down at all for me. When you were a student, did you have an opportunity to take any of his classes? I did not. But I've heard him. I did. Good, did David ever? I did. Yeah. I did. He was excellent. Yeah. In fact, he was really hard to follow sometimes. He was so, I mean, so, so involved in, this was American constitutional law, but he knew it backwards, forward, sideways. Didn't he, he didn't use yeah. prepared uh, notes or anything, just talk. And he's, he's just such a gentleman. Yeah. But yeah. I've heard him speak multiple times. I've heard him speak in, you know, Judge Moon is close with Professor Howard. They were in law school at the same time. Yeah. And so he asked me a lot about Judge Moon all the time. There was a great article on paper by Judge Moon yesterday. Yeah. Your yeah, my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. I'll be I'm glad to talk with anybody after. Thank you so much. Please grab a cookie on your way.